Oh, this is exciting. I've been looking forward to this, like an in-depth discussion on Rambo from, from someone who actually has coherent right. thoughts on it. <laughs> well, here we go. For the last 15 years, he has been one of the most insightful movie critics around. Beginning at the Dallas Observer in 1981, he came into his own... Uh, he came into his own with his uh, at the turn of the century as one of the rotating lead critics of the New York Press. There, he was the perfect counterbalance to the kamikaze writings of Armand White. At the New York Times, he brought his keen sense of observation and rigorous attention to detail to movies that were not exactly top priorities in the Times Arts and Leisure section, films like James Wan's Dead Silence. In January 2006, he launched the site, The House Next Door, one of the very best places to find in-depth writing on movies, trends, and all things important to the serious cinema file. And he recently turned over the editing duties of The House to Movie Geeks United contributor Keith Ulick in order to embark on a new journey as a filmmaker. Please welcome uh, former film critic turned filmmaker Matt Zoller Sykes. Matt, are you with us? Yeah, I'm there. Welcome, Matt. <laughs> Holy crap, I feel like I should, uh, you know, I should have brought a virtual bottle of wine for everybody yeah. after that. Well, you, you, or like you should be on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, you know, with graffiti on my nose. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so Rambo, you know, let's, let's get into it. Uh, Rambo, Absolutely. beautiful thing. We're Bring it on. The, we're talking about the box set. And so, Matt, since uh, you're probably one of the, uh, I don't know how old, uh, uh, Jerry is, but you were around when First Blood came out, so my first... I was, yeah, and actually, you know, you mentioned New York Press, uh, and I just have to bring up, just because it's apropos here, God- mm-hmm. Godfrey Cheshire, who is the other uh, member of the Triptych yeah. trilogy, whatever, uh, he told me that his all-time favorite movie marquee was one in a small town in North Carolina, he actually snapped a picture of it, and it was from 1982, and it was two screens, and it was showing The Last American Virgin and First Blood. Wow. <laughs> yes. You could that is yeah. a, oh, there's a double proof if you wanted. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That but, is a uh, yeah, but yeah, I did. I saw uh, I I saw the first one uh I saw the first one uh on HBO. I actually missed it in the theater and okay. uh really liked it a lot and and um uh and somewhere between 1982 and 85 uh I started to develop a sense of movie history, or at least recent movie history. Right. I was watching a lot of films from the 50s and 60s and 70s and kind of working my way back. And uh, between 82 and 85, that's when Rambo went from being, uh, as you mentioned, Aaron, kind of a, a, a sort of a weird, like, you know, put him in the telepod from the fly type of merger cool. of the 70s anti-hero and the 80s ass-kicking, you know, right. Superman uh, to just being a flat-out Superman and, and kind of a, a tool of the state, like in the way that the, in the Frank Miller's The Dark Knight, how he sort of reinterpreted Superman as, as the president, as sort of an extension of the executive branch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, good point. Yeah, and, and, you know, he's emblematic. He's, you know, and, and Pauline Kael in her review of Rambo too called him our, our, our national palooka. And that's definitely the way he set him up. But, you know, to answer one of the one of the uh, questions that was posed earlier here, do you think that this is partly atoning for the fact that he was in uh, Switzerland teaching girls how to play volleyball during the Vietnam War? And, and you know, maybe, but then again, I just think Stallone is shameless. I mean, like his, his career, his entire <laughs> okay, career. I think that's a good note, but thank you for saying that. His entire that. career has been shameless, and I think that, you know, if uh, First Blood had been made in 1979, uh, Rambo would have died at the end. And yeah. and uh, and if he, you know, I, I just think because that was more suited to the '70s era, and I think right. that he is a master. And when I say that he, you know, he's he is an opportunist, he, uh, you know, I mean that just as a statement of fact. Like this guy can he he's he's got a Rambo-like ability to kind of smell the wind and know you know what way you know the future is coming from. Like he's he's been you know we. We make fun of him for stuff like Stop and My Mom Will Shoot, but uh, he's been behind some pretty major zeitgeist movies in his own right. way. And, and this major, series was yeah. absolutely right up at the top, along with Rocky. Well, and here, here. I appreciate that, Matt, for you saying that and addressing that, because I've always wanted to know what, you know, because there was always that little mini, a mini controversy when that came out, that factoid about his where he was during the war when Rambo 2 came out. So I really do appreciate you addressing well, that. Here's a question, and we, we, we posed it early, and that. Why do you think 
people were more nostalgic for Rocky Balboa and not Rambo because they 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 you know you know Stallone obviously saw that Rocky Balboa worked and so it would seem obvious that particularly in this uh, our saturation in the Iraq War that maybe a Rambo film would work. But why do you think people were nostalgic for one and not for the other? Could it be that if Rambo had come out in oh three oh four it would have clicked more than coming out? That's of possible. But then again, one thing I will say for the Rambo films, I, I don't think any of them rise to the level of art except maybe possibly the first one which mm-hmm. is a pretty pretty great action film and very very serious for the type of movie that it is um but uh but I will say that they were politically engaged and politically aware and they did not happen to be my particular type of politics but they mm-hmm. at least they had that and and they had that in the way that the films that John Wayne made in the 60s uh, were and early 70s that were expressing kind of a Nixon silent majority attitude expressed uh, their politics. And, right. and uh, you don't see that really now. It's very, very rare. In fact, it's almost unprecedented for a, a, an action hero to uh, – for their for the for the action that they are responsible for to be linked to a particular view of of you know how American force should be projected onto the world, and when you do get it, it's usually pretty subtle, and there's often there's kind of a more bitter aftertaste. But I think also you know just again to go back to the idea of Stallone as a product of his uh, uh, you know as a product of his times and as a guy who wanted to epitomize his times. Rambo 2 came out in 85. It was uh, right after, it was shot sometime around the time that Reagan was running for re-election. It was pretty much a lock. And uh, the country was extremely conservative, and we were not involved in an actual official shooting war of any kind, although we had all sorts of covert stuff going on. So, so we were very safe. We were very safe, we could, and we could imagine this fantasy of uh, this Superman with scars on his chest running around in the jungle with an M60, you know? Like, we could right. do that. And, and Top Gun was part of that. That came out a year later. Um, and uh, and I just don't think it's any surprise that, with the exception of World War II, uh, when we've been at war, the movies have tended to be a little bit darker and a little more... Uh, there's a kind of a bitter aftertaste when, when uh, America or its representative projects an immense amount of force onto somebody who represents the other. And it ought to be that way. And even World War II, the chickens came home to roost with film noir. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. Let, so let me like, take a phone call real quick, Aaron. I'm sorry. We've we okay. got a phone call up here. Uh, C, uh, C. Duck, uh, you're on the air. C. Duck, are you with us? Okay. This headset, thing that headset working. thing's not working out. Uh, no, not it's working not. working out very well. Let, let, uh, let me, let me we, ask you this. We tried C. Duck. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Let me ask you this, man. Uh, yeah. In that, uh, but so but going back to the original question, why? So why do you think that Rambo, this last one in Burma, didn't click the way that Rocky Balboa did? Why, I think he think? just waited. I think I think he just waited too long to make it. You yeah. know, I mean, I think the gap between uh, between installments was too immense, and there wasn't that presence that there was with, say, the Indiana Jones movies. Right. You know, the Indiana Jones movies, for one thing, were just more, they had more universal appeal because uh, Indy did not represent any particular political standpoint. There was nothing controversial about the character of Indiana Jones, although not at all, right. people people had their issues with the second film, but uh, but not certainly nothing on the order of Rambo where people were arguing about it, you know? It's um, not until, I've, I've read a couple of reviews, just to digress, to digress real quick on the Indy thing, it's not until a couple of reviews on this latest film that I've read uh, a couple of critics have said that Indy is, is uh, has been is spiritually aware and has been very respectful to the Bible, which I found kind of odd because me and Jamie were talking that up until, you know, even in Last Crusade, uh, at best, Indiana Jones is a secularist. At worst, he's an atheist. He's See, I don't, I, I don't, I didn't get that impression from the movie. I got the sense that he was, you know, Maybe he was respectful of of uh, the idea that there's a world beyond the one that we can see that we can mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I definitely got that sense. And if you were Indiana Jones, wouldn't you be? Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, if you've been through what he's been through and you've seen, you know, but angels you come to... out of the ark and make mm-hmm. people's heads explode, you know, I'd I'd get to a church, you yeah. know, <laughs> or the but power the of the Grail. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. There's an 800 year old knight waving goodbye to you. I, that would that would and cure that would cure your atheism right quick, I would think. Yeah, and does he yeah. have eternal life because he drank from the Grail? 
Well, that's a good question. Yeah. But if he did, it was redundant because you know he <laughs> couldn't. He, nobody could lay a hand on him up to then. So <laughs> right. Well, let, Let's let's try to bring Rambo into the to the present day. And that I remember you telling me one time that I think one of, if not the first piece of kind of film writing you wrote in college was back in '88. And so you contrasted uh, the character of John Rambo to John McClane because Rambo Three and Die Hard came out at the same. They were. They were out during the same summer, and I was really struck by that. And and '88, you know, in retrospect. It seems kind of hard to believe, but in 88, uh, everybody was anticipating that the third Rambo film would be gigantic, because the second one had been. Right. And Bruce Willis was a guy from Moonlighting. And when Blind it was, uh, yeah, and, and when it was uh, reported that he'd been paid $5 million, the princely sum of $5 million, which is like, you know, nowadays that, that, that should be read aloud by Dr. Evil while he's chewing on his pinky, you know, <laughs> so much more for that. But uh, the idea of this TV actor being paid $5 million, basically because they knew that this movie was going to be a hit and they needed a leading man and they didn't particularly care who it was. Mm-hmm. And they got, they got Willis and he was hot at the time and it made him a star. But, uh, but yeah, it, 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 it was striking that die, audiences really took to Die Hard. And uh, also to Midnight Run, which came out that summer. And, and they were not... Deadpool. Yeah, and they were yeah, but they were not. Uh, I didn't get the sense that the Deadpool and Rambo three had nearly as much excitement around them. You know, no, I didn't hear did people not. talking they... about those movies, and and even in the summer of eighty eight, people I, people I knew were already quoting Midnight Run and mm-hmm. and like dragging people to see Die Hard who wouldn't be caught dead going to see an action film starring Bruce Willis. And in fact, I personally brought some friends to see that, including my friend Barry Maupin. Mm-hmm. who uh, later, uh, he was a musician, he later was a music supervisor on my first feature, but Barry, uh, I, I dragged him out of his uh, room at the fraternity house and said, you have to see this movie, it's playing at the Valley View Mall, and I got and borrowed a car from my friend John and drove him out there, and we saw it at the last show on a Thursday night at the mall, and we were the only two people in the theater. And it was it was late September. I mean, it played for a long time for, for a movie like That's that. That's back when movies would play for months mm-hmm. and not weeks. Yeah. yeah, and uh, he and he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And at the end, when they when the music segued into uh, "Ode to Joy," he turned to the projectionist and yelled, "Crank it!" Yeah. And the projectionist well, cranked it. it well, cause it, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. Would you say that 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 begins the transition of Rambo Three, where it truly is an out and out comic book, indestructible character? Where John McClane, the image that I always come back to is him picking glass out of his feet. That is. That yes. scene is something that everyone in the audience could relate to. Well, but I think it's more a matter of tone, because if you recall, all of the Rambo films have had a scene where Rambo tends to his own wound with no anesthesia. And in the first one, he stitches up an arm wound. And in the second one, I can't remember what it is. I think he... Oh God, I know there's got to be an instance of him doing that. And the third one, he like pours gunpowder into a... Right wound and lights it and goes Roar! you know that's my favorite yeah yeah and uh you know that, that that was sort of the very erotic that was sort of the indiana that was sort of the uh, rambo films answer to the creepy crawly scenes in the indiana jones movies mm-hmm. i think you know that that's yeah, yeah. where the audience goes oh my god i can't believe we did that but uh but so rambo did that too you know and but i just think it's a matter of tone and i think when you actually look objectively at what happens in the Die Hard films, it's no more or less preposterous than what Rambo gets involved in. And in fact, when Die Hard was being shopped around, uh, it was called, it was being sold as Rambo in an office building. Mm. You and, know, and, and you can see that. In, it is funny up until this, this last Rambo, I mean, this last Die Hard film, which we won't acknowledge, but the, <laughs> the, uh, the second one and the third one, as preposterous as the plot got, airport, you know, yeah. or Island of Manhattan. That yeah. that human quality of the John McClane character was there. By the time of each film, he was a bloody mess in a lot of, and we could still relate to him as like that is yeah. going to be a lot of pain the next mm-hmm. one. This last film, he was, yeah. You know, this last film we couldn't relate to him at all. But and, not know, really. I mean, I think I could sort of relate to him as a dad, but yeah. that was about it because you know I couldn't see yeah. him. You know, when he was swinging from a cable and beating the crap out of a guy, it was just, you know. Yeah. That, but again, that's a, that too is a matter of tone. If Indiana Jones did that, I don't think I'd think twice about it. Well, and here, uh, so we'll try to wrap this up. What do you think, because I have 
my own theory on like, what do you think is the new t- arch- the new version of Rambo? Because, and, and when I say Rambo, I mean in that this character who is, uh, at least supposedly according to Stallone, has been apolitical, but obviously there's a lot of conservative. Politics. I think it's J- it's Jason Bourne, without Jason. a doubt. Jason other- Bourne. Jason Bourne <laughs> is you know he is. Uh, he is Rambo in a lot of ways. He's he's a he's a killing machine created by the government who turns on his creators. You know, he's Frankenstein's monster in the same way that Rambo was. And and you know, what is the story of the Bourne films but a Frankenstein's monster seeking out his father in order to uh, get an explanation for who he is and why he is the way he is, and then he kills his daddy. And then uh, in the second film, he he finds out there's a daddy behind the daddy, and he has to kill him. And then. Be, um, behind every bad daddy, there's another bad daddy. That's that's the Bourne films, and I think they they're very political in their in their, you know, their critique of executive branch secrecy well, and power. And the other the other character I want to throw out, it's not as I guess you could say in depth as Jason Bourne, but one who in the last couple of seasons has started to kind of break down in his resolve to a certain extent is Jack Bauer. Yeah, Jack Bauer too, and I think that Jack. Uh, well, I haven't watched it too much in recent seasons, so I can't speak authoritatively to that. But, but Jack always struck me as much more of a. He was more of a Rambo who never left the reservation. <laughs> you know, I mean, he he's he's part of the machine, and even when he's gone, he's not gone for long, and he's instinctively loyal to uh, to his bosses and to his country and all of that. And when he gets betrayed, he, then he turns on them. But it's not, you know, he, he tends to still, in his weird way, give people the benefit of the doubt. And and uh, he seems to be. But yeah, he's definitely there. But but I don't think he gets. Uh, I don't know. I feel like Bourne has a more global view of of yeah. his own fate and why he is who he is. I I, I love those movies. I think they're you know, just great. Bourne, they is, are. Bourne is pretty. It, it seems that. Just on the Jack Bauer tip, real quick, it seems to be he's only lo- he seems to be loyal to an ideal of America and just kind of temporarily loyal to who's ever in kind of an authority figure because he's never really he, he seems to have this this the the belief and it just seems to work out in his favor that he's always going to do what is the best in the best interest of the country and please don't get in my way. Exactly always, right. He said, well, he's more like Dirty Harry in that way. You know, and the way that Dirty Harry was, uh, Dirty Harry did what was necessary for society, even if society didn't want him to. You know, he was the guy who did what, uh, he did the dirty jobs that the other people didn't have the stomach for. That was the concept, I think. And Bauer definitely walks in those shoes. Yeah. It is interesting, just on this last one, I guess, in that, that these characters who kind of po- uh, pivot on kind of a conservative value, in that... It's not, it seems to be they they just don't they they have a real distrust in McLean and Rambo and Jack Bauer and Dirty Harry a real disdain for anyone who has a higher rank or even a higher pay grade than they are. They, yeah, they, absolutely. That's just anyone you know, no matter how small the difference in rank or pay grade, they are not to be trusted until they've earned it. And even then, they. Well, I think that's the. Uh, I, I think that's a really important point because. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it plays into the way that uh, movies, the way that the idea of the rebel has been depoliticized and kind of turned into a label. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's right. that it's that it's that sort of Ivan Reitman movie formula. Like you know, the Bill Murray characters and Meatballs and Stripes and Ghostbusters. He's anti-authoritarian only in the sense that he's rude to people who could who could have him fired or sent to jail. You know, it's not like he's really a rebel against the system. He's not striking against what the system represents. The only thing he's against is people people telling him what to do. That's all. And and I do think there's a definite strain of that among a lot of action heroes and and I don't think Rambo really fell into that. And I have to give credit for uh, for that uh to Stallone and, you know, his collaborators, but mostly Stallone because he was really driving that franchise. He he did have a sense of uh yeah, I was just going to say he did. He did have a sense of uh, he he did adhere to the one bad apple school of thought, though. I mean, you, the, ultimately, it was usually revealed that it was not the CIA that was really at fault. It was this bad CIA guy. You yeah. know. <laughs> Let me pick up a phone call. We have a listener phone call, and then our <clears throat> next guest is on the line. We'll get to her in just a couple of minutes because that's going to be a fantastic segment as well. Three oh one listener phone call. You're on the air. Hi, uh, this is Jamie. Yes. Hey Jamie, this, this is Sean. Uh, uh, Jerry's friend. I called yeah. a couple weeks ago during the Indiana hey, Jones up, trivia man? show. 
<laughs> you, you there, Jer- Jerry? Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> well, listen, I, I got to apologize. Uh, I remember you said 6 o'clock. Here it is, like at like 7 o'clock. I said, oh, my gosh, the show's on there. Let me see if I can call in and see what's going on. Because I had no clue what the show was about. So I'm totally unprepared. <laughs> you are online more often than you know. <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, it was interesting. It's a real interesting conversation. I mean, this is the kind of conversation you and I have. So, uh, anyway, uh, no. I'll, I'll, Let me I'll, ask you real quick, Sean. Do you have a preference of uh, of Rambo films out of the four of them? Yeah, I do. I, I've always liked the first one, um, but I, I did not disdain any of the the other ones. I haven't seen the fourth one yet. Um, I, I like. There's there's two things about like the first one I like because for some reason. Sylvester Stallone is like the only male actor can, that can get me to cry because when he starts crying, he's like, what's left? Well, we all got to cry if he cries. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, but I just really like the way... He looks like he's he, being wrung. He looks like he's being physically grabbed and wrung out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. Cries. yeah. That, he's that, always that, had the saddest eyes. and He's had some of the saddest eyes for him. He any, does. You know. he, he has, he's got a great way of... Okay, he goes through all this radical... Uh, uh, monstrous behavior, but it's it's like we all feel justified in it because you know you've got to see him get torn down and beaten to the ground before he l- finally lashes out. It's almost like he's been giving subliminal warnings all along because he doesn't want to hurt anybody. And but it gets to the point where they just decide not to read that. Maybe and here he goes. Yeah. And, and yeah, it just well, well it's like the incredible it's the Incredible Hulk. Don't yeah. don't make me angry. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Sean. You're welcome to stay on the line if you'd like to. Uh, Continue listening, my friend. Uh, oh, sure, sure. But, That'll but be I fine. appreciate you calling in. Yeah, thank All you, right, I'll, I will take up your time. All right, take care. <laughs> thank I'll... you, buddy. Uh, let me ask a question in there, and I'll let you close it up uh, right. so we can bring our, ne- our next guest. With Rambo 4, what do you think uh, these characters have? It sounds a little silly given the kind of film it is, but perhaps not. Given, given the arc of all of these characters involved, what do you think each side learns, Stallone and, and, and the, the volunteers? Uh, the, the medical volunteers, because it's it's implied that each of them come to a different realm of uh, uh, they reach a different realm of knowledge at the end of this blood soaked journey. Uh, I mean, did you get that sense? What do you think it wants to leave you with, if anything? Is that to Aaron or to me? No, 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 no that, that's to you. That's, that's to you. you, man. That's to you. Oh uh, well, I I felt very strongly when I saw it uh, that this was about as strong a pro-intervention in Iraq movie that I've ever seen, and there haven't been too many of those, uh, because Hollywood, as we know, skews left. And uh, (laughs) uh, I thought it was very strongly uh, a pro-interventionist tract, I mean, to the point of being uh, almost a list of talking points. I mean, the characters, when you listen to the dialogue coming out of their mouth, it's Along the lines of, well, what you know, it's a humanitarian. They're attempting a humanitarian solution to a problem that can only be solved with military force. That's that's the plot of the movie, and they happen to call the place Burma, but it's basically Iraq. And the lead guy has that sort of tin pot dictator vibe that Saddam Hussein had. And, right. And uh, you know, I, I think it's really just a case of lights. Like, you know, changing changing the name of the country and and shooting it somewhere different. But I think it's really it's it's Iraq. It's really an Iraq war film. And right. and right. Stallone is very again very crafty. And I think that it's not uh, his fault that uh, audiences failed to show up. I think he completely he, he created a Rambo movie that was absolutely in the spirit of the second and third ones. You know, it was it was uh, wore its politics on its sleeve while while maintaining plausible deniability and saying it was just a <laughs> story. Right, now you're right. But it was you know, great. I enjoyed it. I mean But yeah, and it was you know, and I actually liked uh, I liked his character. I thought his character was quite interesting and I found that the final shot of the movie were literally bringing him home uh quite moving. Quite moving. Home to the, only thing, the only and it was like an homage to the searchers almost, the way they shot it. It was like the searchers in reverse with Ethan Edwards coming back to the house, and I thought right. like the only thing that would be the only thing that would make this perfect would be if he gets to his dad's house, and the door opens and there's John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his father would have to be 120 years old by now too. I find that I that think was he, the possibility I think he of that would be, but he can yeah. still. <laughs> what was up with that? I mean, but he can still. Yeah. Well, there should be a whole. There, there could be an entire piece written about movies that I in a New York Press piece that I wrote about The Rock. Uh, I, I labeled a certain type of film emotional Viagra. 
mm-hmm. you know, because they're right. basically all these movies about, like, they're old guys, but they can still kick ass, and they're sleeping with women a third their age. Like, there's so right. many of those. Like, Sean Connery and, and, you know, Anthony Hopkins cornered the market on them for a while, and now it's, you know, Stallone and Harrison Ford and all these guys, John, you know, Bruce Willis, they're all coming back and doing it. Uh, right. Women don't really get allowed to do that, but, uh, you know, that's a whole other issue. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, I'll let you ask one more, and then we're going to close up. Well, I, I think I, I think we've covered pretty much everything on on, on the Rambo films. On, on the, I, I just think that uh, finally, uh, it's just that you know Stallone has said that he's gonna he he'd always mess with the character. But what, what do you think uh, that he's moving on to his next project? He wants to do a remake of a uh, Death Wish. I have no idea what stage this project is in. Uh, but what do you? I mean, to me, that almost seems kind of inevitable that Stallone would want to well run yeah it sort of is and he kind of already did that you know mm-hmm. he kind of already did that with um, uh, Cobra right you know which was very much kind of a you know sort of like death wish after after a couple of lines of coke you know I mean, that, <laughs> that, that sort of a vibe to it you know but uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, I just think I, I I'm tempted to say that he's miscalculating, but then again, you never know. It's Stallone; he keeps surprising you. Um, I, 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 I get Carter, and he couldn't do that right. He didn't. No, he right. couldn't do that right, and that was because he wanted to be liked. And I think that's ultimately Stallone's fatal flaw more often than not, as he plays these characters who are sort of beyond the question of likability. Like that's not really why you would watch them, and I think that's what made the first Rambo film so memorable and so durable is the fact that the movie itself presented a, a guy in a situation where you have to sympathize with him, but it wasn't out there holding your hand and telling you how sweet he was. There was this, he, was like, he was like a beast. He was like a, a, a hunted animal, and, and I think that worked. That's a point. That's a great no, I, point. I, I, I'll, I'll just close up. I just think, you know, it was funny when Roy Scheider passed that I remember a lot of bloggers and a lot of people said, well, you know, you, I kind of wish Tarantino had given him uh, one of those last roles. And I kind of do wish that Tarantino, if anyone, I mean, this is truly out there wish fulfillment, is that if ever someone could truly use Stallone in a good way, I would think Tarantino would be the best person to kind of show people what Stallone could do as an actor. Because he is more than Schwarzenegger. I mean, Schwarzenegger gets, I guess, the better reviews. But Stallone has always been the better actor and the better writer, if you will. It's just that he doesn't seem... Yeah, I agree, that. although he's got, he's just got enough sort of I don't know he tends to sh- he tends to sabotage himself in a couple of different ways but I think mm-hmm. Stallone in some ways does have the temperament of an artist and that's what makes him intriguing even when his movies are terrible that's right, right. Yeah. yeah you're right, right. Well, Matt thank you thank you so much buddy for joining you, us tonight Matt, thank you thank you for having me thank you alrighty take care guys thank you Matt that's Matt Zoller Seitz that's a great treat to have him have him on the show finally oh, that's, uh, absolutely and an interesting conversation, a much longer conversation about Rambo than I thought I would be able to carry on. <laughs> but that's I must good, say, that's... that is a brilliant line that uh, Cobra is death wish after five lines, after a couple of lines of Coke. I like uh, Cobra is one of my guilty pleasures. So it, I, I love Cobra too, man. <laughs>